Well, these are posters. If any of you want to put out posters yet so for people who are coming in late, uh, nothing else that can be used as scratch paper. We're going to try to be very short. We're going to, we're going to try and be very short because the... Um, I can't run the air conditioner, it's too noisy, and the lights on, it gets hot awfully quick, even with all the windows open. So we'll try to be within an hour, and we're going to continue exactly where we left off last year. And uh, I've thought of some about it, and I am going to continue all the way through the whole course, which is probably going to take about four or five years. Hey, Heidi probably going to take about four or five years to get through it all, but we're going to do it two tracks so that what is done orally will be different than what the handouts are. That way you get two points of view, and um, what the handouts are are going to be something that is... The, what the handouts are going to be is something that is going to be more astrological, you know, more that you can study it like a book. And uh, the other will try to be more uh, psychological and spiritual and come to better understanding. All right. Now, some people were not here last year. So these are the charts that we're working with if you don't have a set of charts. This is an intermediary course, and it's called Character Appreciation with Astrology. And we're going to try to like people as much as we learn astrology. And the way the course works is that there are three sections to it, or three divisions to it. We're just about done with the first division. And the first division is everybody should have at least one of these. It's called the Profile Index. And we're down now on the examples for the last two uh, profiles. And um, they, these are the generalization profiles that give you the general tone of the whole of the air at the time the person was born. And the way it works is... First, you want to look at all the broad things, and that's what we're doing in this first third. In uh, three classes from now, we will begin with an approximation system. And the approximation system is so that we can tell the relative strength of each planet and the relative strength of each aspect so that we can make more precision understandings and know the relative significance or importance of what's going on. So tonight we'll finish up with examples from the focus profiles. Let's see, Kate doesn't have one of these. And um, on, on the chair over there are leftovers from handouts from last year. And you can pick out as many as you're missing so that you can have a full set. I, I don't, I'm not sure there's a full set there. All right, I guess we're set to go. Last time we did the uh, focus profiles for the first eight charts. And this time we're looking at the second eight charts, and we're beginning with the chart of Yokio Mishima. Famous Japanese literary individual. Extremely prolific a genius in many regards, but he had a penchant for suicide of the most ugly kind. <laughs> Jack gave me one of his biographies of Mishima, and when he committed Harakari, it was, the whole thing was botched. And it's very hard to do because the abdominal muscles are so strong that he had to take the knife with all of his strength to just get it through the abdominal muscles and then pull it along for five <laughs> inches like that. And then he was supposed to be decapitated. 
because he had a razor sharp samurai sword, which is the second part of uh, Harakari, and his assistant failed on the first two times and uh, struck him in the shoulder, and finally somebody else took the sword and took his head right off. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. What we're looking at is profile number 16. And that is the agreement profile. That is, we're saying that there are three, speaking in rough, there are three primary components to the character. The inmost being, which is indicated by the sun. The middle being, which does the conveying, the shuttlecock between the inner and outer person, which is roughly indicated by the moon. And the outermost person is the ascendant. And when we look at the Mishima chart and do the counting, we find out that the sun is in a negative sign and the moon is in a negative sign, but uh, the earth is positive. It's in a fiery sign. And on top of that, the ruler of the ascendant is also fiery in its own sign, but not conjoined the ascendant. Uh, Mars, is, Mars is in a positive sign and its own sign Aries. Traditionally, when we think of Earth, we think of a static element. It's not like water, which is fluid, and air, which is even more so, and fire, which is so indefinite, for the most part, it can't even be seen. So what we're seeing here, then, is some kind of... Um, contradiction, a very funny contradiction. Normally, the spirit is associated with fire, and the physical body ruled by the ascendant is associated with earth. And so, we have just the opposite. In the case of Mishima, uh, the dense physical form, which is normally made of clay, in this case, is fiery. So, there is a reversal or an inversion in the natural order of things. Any time that the elements of the three primary parts of the character are not of the same positivity or of the same negativity, there is something of an ad harmony. And in this case, probably there's a the very divided individual. The inner person is seeking for permanence. The sun in Capricorn wants things to be permanent in the same way that a rock is permanent. And even its shape doesn't change. So that's way, the way he inwardly sees things. Now the spirit is eternal, but it is not eternal in a static way. So what he's trying to accomplish there is in itself uh, impossible. When we turn to the middle person, the soul nature indicated by the moon, it is in Virgo. And it is in one of the more um, changeable earthy signs, like dust or sand or grains or things like that, are all... Uh, ruled by Virgo, and this indicates that his soul nature, the way he has developed it, is um, attuned to facts, or what the modern language would say, factoids. <laughs> when you look at the outer nature, so, so even though the Virgo, the moon in Virgo, can move these bits around, the bits themselves are permanent. Or relatively speaking. But when you look at the outer nature, it is very dynamic, martially dynamic. And Mars being an Aries right there indicates a driving 
forceful kind of nature. He performed, as a child, he was anemic and he was very small, but the more he uh, developed in life, the more he worked on uh, uh, physical culture. He was something like a gym rat. And even when he came to the United States or places like that, he would head for the gym because he would know the kinds of people that were hanging out at the gym because that's the kind of people that, you know, that kind of person is the same the world over. And, um, in fact, as he, the uh, physical culture eventually led directly to the martial arts, and only we'll talk about that at a later time. So, outwardly, he is a very uh, fierce kind of person. And outwardly, with the sun in Aries, he had he believed in death in youth, and he thought that the most perfect aesthetic was to die as a young person by a bloody death, not necessarily suicide, but Mars. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I'm focusing on one thing, and my mouth is saying something else. And yes. So usually in life. The outer person develops first, and the more inward character comes out later in life as there is more soul growth. Uh, this is not exactly his case. He did believe in the bloody death even as a child, but uh, and he did, as he got older, became more and more conservative or reactionary. His, his reaction, though, was not a political reaction. His conservatism was not political, but it was based on some uh, spiritual kind of standard. So he was radical in youth and conservative in old life, and that, uh, that, that holds on. He was never at peace with his conservatism. So that uh, the whole character is very clearly shown in rough in this profile. Now, let's look, go on to the last profile, the stage profile. He was born after the opposition, but before the second trine. But, his, but uh, the moon and sun are not in trine. And when I worked on the notes, I realized that I had been remiss in that I had never given you a chart of when in the solar lunar cycle, in the lunation cycle, when the different aspects occur. So I have two of them, two such charts. On the front side is the uh, rough thing on what day of the moon the sextile happens or the trine or the square. And it's for a rough thing. And it's much more usable. And then on the back side I have the... Uh, astronomical mean time when each of the uh, when each of the aspects occurs in, in the solar lunar cycle. It isn't absolutely constant, but this is pretty close. I, I've written it down to minutes. So this is something you want to keep right on your desk as you're working with this. And I should have given this to you with the first assignment uh, looking at the uh, focus profiles. All right. His, if you look at his chart, the cusps follow the cosmic mandala, the standard. That is, he has Aries on the first house, and he has Capricorn on the tenth house. So he's very much in sync with the whole cosmic standard. So when we look at this stage of the lunation cycle, approaching that second trine, and looking at the position of the sun, it looks like he's trying to approach some perfect standard, some ideal standard that is a social form, something that is sentinel and signal for everyone. The first trine usually is an accomplishment trine. When the sun is in front of the moon by 120 degrees, and the second trine is much more a universalizing trine. It's something that uh, takes apart what has been done and sees it relative to 
the bigger picture of things. So it looks like from this stage test, it looks like he's trying to understand the inner meaning of cultural and societal history. And he's doing so by fact. He not only studied literature, the history of literature, he studied all of Japanese history. And he did so because the further he went on in life, the more he was seeking what was, what you might say, the Japanese spirit. And so that is what that second trying is like. It's the more universalizing trying. And with the sun in the tenth house, he's trying to universalize to a cultural standard. And so the whole uh, so the whole uh, stage of the cycle that he is in is set up for doing something like that yes the first trying is when some in the first half all the first stage is a concretizing time and if you're trying to create something, the creative impulse comes at the new moon. At the first trine, you have completed or perfected your creation. Then you, then you, uh, then the critics get it. And then pretty soon you start thinking from the other point of view. Then at the full moon, everything starts going into deterioration. Everything gets broken down. It's more destructive and it it's more universal. It's something like if you wrote a poem and you put an enormous amount of labor into it and it says exactly what you want it to say. Then you give it to somebody else and they start pointing out other things in it that may have been part of your unconscious intent in the first place. And so then the, it's more universalized when other people get their hands on it. So as part of the breakdown and analysis, yeah, things become universalized. And so the picture that I get of uh, what Mishima is trying to do or what the stage test represents, it's almost as if he thinks that there is a perfect statue of China, of, of Japan, and of the Japanese spirit. And what he's doing is he's chipping more and more pieces away until that perfect statue manifests itself by, you know, it's a reductive process rather than, you know, like taking a uh, sculpt metal or something like that and building up to a perfect statue. And that kind of thinking that there is something already there and that you take away everything that isn't it until you reach the perfection, that is a very East Oriental uh, notion. Uh, a lot of Chinese people uh, do the same thing. There's a famous quote from a uh, uh, Chinese woodcarver that... Uh, he fasted for three days, and when he fasted for three days, he went out into the woods, and uh, a tree announced itself to him that it contained the statue that he wanted. And then he gave thanks to the tree and cut it down, and when he cut it out, he had exactly the statue that he wanted. And, but at any rate, the uh, the uh, destructive part of the second stage, stage of the cycle, when you're going through the second aspects, is... Um, is like that. It's reducing until you get what you want and something that is universal. Yes. Yes. There, there, in this in this chart, there's only a second trying. Okay. Uh, like if if you put the sun and moon on the ascendant and let the sun stand there as if it were permanent. The moon goes forward till about here, and then that produces the first trine in the cycle. When it gets over here, it's an opposition. And when it gets over here, uh, it is um, the second trine. This is the second square. That's the first square. Yeah, right. It's, it, it's building up to it. It's building up to it. There's not an orb. Uh, I, I was speaking very quickly, and I should be speaking more quickly because we're giving ourselves four minutes per chart. <laughs> if we want to have an hour's class, it has to, it has to work that way. And what is, Roz, if you didn't get this over, what we're trying to do with these last uh, two.
two profiles we're doing the general of the general meaning to say we're trying to get the uh, whole agreement of the whole character from the whole from inside out or from outside in whether there is in the whole general character whether there is some kind of a character agreement and then we're trying to we're saying that what is in the air and the character of uh, what is in the air is indicated most by the solely lunar uh, state at the at the hour of birth this is something that uh, probably everyone should do with their chart all right Uh, no, I mean the quincunx, because you can lay them on the chart and have put the conjunction at the uh, at the um, first house cusp or the Aries cusp, and then the first uh, quincunx is is like Virgo is like what the first quincunx is like, and that's what the critics are, you know, the logic choppers, and they say this is very fine, but and then they have all those little buts, and they get you like. Uh, one synapse at a time. <laughs> I can say it. I have I have Virgo rising. I can say it and get away with it. All right. Ethel Barrymore. I'm having a hard time getting a really good uh, biography for Ethel Barrymore. I got to keep up with Heidi because Heidi's been reading biographies all summer. Oh. I'm, She's going to she's going to put me to shame with all of this. So we may only take two minutes to talk about Ethel Barrymore. Oops, she's all done already. <laughs> uh, this is a very interesting chart in regard to the agreement. The sun is positive; it's in Leo. The moon is negative. It's in Cancer, and the Ascendant is positive. It's in Libra. So it's like inwardly she's eager. Outwardly she's open and eager. But getting things through, things get held back. Cancer is one of those absorbing kinds of signs. It tries to hold things. Uh, if it were up to cancer, it would never give birth. And after birth, it would keep the children with the mother forever and ever. So there's something very holding about this. The uh, moon happens to be sextile to Pluto. Uh, and that may be even more holding. It may be an obsessive kind of holding. And the moon is conjoined to the dragon's tail, which is all impedimental. It has a Saturnine quality that it doesn't make life easy. The South Node, yes, Dragon's Tail. So, the whole combination regarding the moon is like absorption. The sun tries to pour out light and it gets absorbed by the moon and the moon doesn't want to let go. The ascendant draws in facts or data from nature and it gets absorbed in the soul nature and the soul nature doesn't want to let go of it. Now you can see that this has something uh, positive about it. If you're an actress, it's not a pleasant situation. In fact, the whole thing might have been a result of having been an actor or an actress in a previous life. Because if you're on stage, the timing is slower than it is in life. There are uh, holdups. And something like this, where she has the impulse, to, in the leonine impulse to express herself, and then the cancer holds that, it has something like a sustaining quality to it. And if the emotions are sustained long enough, it uh, is easier to communicate with the audience. You know how it is often if you have, uh, even on television, you can see it, uh, like my, I myself being very slow-witted, 
I'm, I'm behind. I'm several lines behind what they're saying on television because it all goes by me so fast I don't pick it all up. But if you're on stage, this, this little bit of holding the emotions, uh, even though it makes for an unpleasant character nature, or, you know, like a, like a feeling inside of like having a bottleneck all the time, it might be very good, provided that it is not too long sustained, because if it's too long sustained, it pulls off all of the timing of everything, and it would have the opposite effect. The uh, sun is almost unaspected. It has one square to Pluto, and that also has a certain amount of self-absorption. Leo is known to be absorbed with its own self-esteem, and this might be a consequence of the uh, spiritual self-esteem being carried right into the psychological self-esteem, but the two are fighting with each other. All right, let's quickly move to the stage uh, profile. She's just past the second semi-sextile. She's within the last 30 degrees of a new moon. And that gives a feeling of a finale. The last aspect of any kind, the semi-sextile, is already over. There's nothing forward, nothing to look forward to, nothing more to let go of. So there's something like a feeling of a finale. And when you have the sun and the moon both in the tenth house, this is sort of like a grand finale. You know, this is gonna, this is the one that brings the whole house down. Um, but the sun square Pluto is somewhat blocked and, um, the sun Pluto aspect, she might overdo from the sun Pluto aspect and she might try to overpower things. So all of this, this position of this stage looks like a finale that the moon is falling back into the sun and the sun is trying to overpower in this last stage but it can't do so and this might be like a death throw or something like that. It's sort of like the last ditch effort, the last gasp of life and she senses something, you know, like this is all over. Uh, she was born at a time, I mentioned that in the written note, she was born at a time when the stage was just going out of being the most popular medium. It was being replaced by radio, and it was being replaced by movies. And But she, her brothers, Lionel and John, both went into the movies and both went into the radio. She didn't do that at all. She was sort of like a throwback to like, I'm, I'm a stage person only. And so this, this, you know, like this is it. She, you know, she senses the end of the cycle and she's trying to sustain the fanfare as long as she can do it. And, uh, the glory of the stage, oh, the grand old theater, it'll never be like, the, like this again. And, uh, so she's, uh, looking at life in that way. At least that's one interpretation of it. <laughs> All right. William Butler Yeats. Looking at the uh, profile, sun is positive, moon is positive, ascendant is positive. Sun is air, moon is air, ascendant is air. So this indicates that there are no impediments there are no differences between any of the primary foci. Uh, so she has like a clear shot. Anything that is, uh, he has a clear shot. Anything that is picked up in the external world goes right into the spirit. And anything that comes as a spiritual impulse goes out without impediment. So this is fluency. And it is intellectual fluency because it is an airy sign 
and it is verbal fluency. He's a thinker. He identifies or he sees himself in Gemini and that is as a thinker. Aquarius is probably one of the most intellectual signs of all, capable of massive information, and so what he appears to be outwardly is a uh, intellectual. And so there's not, not much difference between the inward person and the outward person. The moon is trying or applying to a trine of the sun. And it's only about uh, three degrees away. Actually, three degrees and four minutes, I think, is what it is. And um, this indicates a working toward a perfection. And when somebody has something like this, where sun, moon, and ascendant are all in the same element, it is there for that very reason. It is there to perfect something, and something very important has to be said. You get it all out, and you get it all out as quickly as you as you possibly can. And uh, his perfection is such that it is clear, and everything comes to him with a natural ease. I think I mentioned it, uh, I think it's in the written notes, that I've read letters of his to Ezra Pound, and Ezra Pound was no small intellect at all. And the letters back and forth between them, if I could write something that dense with information and that deep with thought in just a casual letter, and I can just see him sitting there writing it out, and uh, this that's, that's what this kind of character is like. Something has been perfected and it comes to him with ease. He can just pour it out. The airy sign uh, positioning indicates probably that he's not as much of a nature poet. He does take some nature subjects, but he, he abstracts away from them pretty quickly. He's more of a literary poet, or more of an intellectual poet, wrote a lot about uh, political themes. The house positionings of the first and fifth house seem to augment everything in the agreement. Looking at the stage, he's at the second trine and right before it while it, while it is applying. And he's at day 20 of the 29 and or so days of uh, the lunation cycle. Now, it's interesting, it's fascinating that all three authors that we're going to discuss tonight, all three male authors have the same thing. They're all at the second trine. Um, so in this profile, he's very much like Mishima, born around that second trine. Now, they both had vastly different temperaments. But they both sought out hidden things from the cultural past. And that seems just a little bit coincidental to me to not be associated with this second trying kind of consciousness. Yeats was interested in English and Irish politics, and he was in the, interested in the history of all literature, and he was interested in the intellectual history of theosophy. So he liked finding hidden cultural meanings. There's not the same kind of satisfaction in the second trine as there is in the first trine. In the first trine, you feel satisfied because you did it and it's yours. But with the second trine, there's much more of a relaxation and much more of an expansion to universals. And that appears to be uh, what he is doing or what he does. He has a very broad view of things. He does, you know, even though he was a partisan in Irish politics, uh, he doesn't, you know, he has a, he has personal views, but those views are put into very big uh, intellectual constructs. Uh, 
I have one difficulty with this. I've read, I'm in the process of reading all of his poetry, and I've read his work on astrology. I have not yet read a complete bi a biography of him, but you would expect with the moon being more closely associated with the ascendant than with the sun, you would think that there would be much more emphasis on observation than on judgment, using the Carl Jung terms. Uh, he di differentiates be between one that is an observer and one that is uh, a judge <coughs> judger. And everything goes forward in the zodiac, and the sun is forward from both the moon and the ascendant, and therefore you'd expect a lot of observation. But I certainly see a lot of judgment in him. I guess you'd have to know him personally, or you'd have to be much more intimate uh, with uh, biographical reflections of people who met him and knew him. Uh, but for me, it's a little bit of a mystery or a little bit of a puzzle that he isn't doesn't seem to be more observant than he is. All right, any questions? <laughs> that will come later on. <laughs> yes, judicious at least. Uh, we'll, we'll get to love obsessions at another time. <laughs> You're a romantic, Michael. You want all those love obsessions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. I have actually have, Gila's heard it. I actually have uh, a re uh, recording of him reading two of his poems. And it sounds like an Irish bard singing. Uh, it's very beautiful. I have that same record, uh, in their own voices it's called. It's a, it's a box set of several CDs. And uh, the oldest one on there is Walt Whitman reading for Edison, reading parts of uh, Leaves of Grass into the, into the old uh, Edison phone. Yeah, <laughs> with the cylinders, yeah. That's, there are some beautiful pieces. I have another set of such poems too, but I don't know where I put it now. I never shared that one with you. It's, it's the second of the other set. All right, what I did with Shirley MacLaine is um, I took the two, I took the uh, agreement test and the stage test and I covered them together. I don't know why I did it, but I did it that way. Looking at the agreement, sun is negative. Moon is negative, ascendant is negative. Sun is earth, moon is earth, ascendant is earth. We have another sun trine moon, only this time it is separating and it is a first trine of sun and moon. The first trine is excellent for expression, it's excellent for accomplishment, but neither of those things seem to be her forte. Her strength doesn't come in personal satisfaction or personal accomplishment. As uh, I see her in her movies, she always seemed more of a character actress than somebody that was a full spectrum actress. If this is so, it might be due to the fact that her real nature is hidden. Sun and moon are in uh, hidden houses. So despite all of this agreement, where the outer person, the middle person, and the inner person are all earthy, it's her character doesn't shine through real clearly. And I think that has to do with the house positioning. Yeats had the uh, perfect agreement like that in expressive houses, the first and the fifth. Hers are in the 
8th and the 12th. They're very secretive kinds of houses. So even though she's in the first half of the lunation cycle, there's something about this that has a um, future about it. You feel more of a promise for the future than the present. And I say that for several reasons, because the moon is in the 12th house, and the 12th house has a twin cusp, where both the front and back cusps of the 12th house are in Virgo. And when that happens on the 12th house, there is an immediate condition from the immediate past life that has to be fulfilled in this life. And it's sort of like, this is let me get this out of the way kind of thing. But even though there is a promise for the future in this chart, once these things are gotten out of the way, it isn't like the show is ending. It isn't like Ethel Barrymore, the show is ending and uh, this is it. And um, it's more like, let me figure this out and get it out of me. Those are problem-solving houses, and she has certain things that she's trying to figure out, and when she wants to get them figured out, they're universal, because the moon, which is uh, the focus of the action, is in the 12th house going toward the first, uh, and the 12th house is universal problems, and she's trying to solve it for all time, and get it out and get it over with and move on from there. So it is like, let me move on to better things uh, and get things done. The picture that I get from the earthy sign position of sun, moon, and ascendant is um, a tunnel such that, uh, you know, if you're in a tunnel, you can even see stars in the daytime. And it gives you a direct conduit blocking out all side activities. And the 8th and 12th house have that uh, hidden type of quality to them. And it's sort of like that even though she's very much back in the earth, there's a tunnel that everything comes right in. Or when she wants to express it out, it goes right out uh, through, a, through a very clear and well-defined uh, passage. All right. We should be almost done already, aren't we? We've been just about an hour. <laughs> ah, that very difficult chart. Mr. Cat Stevens. Tough chart to deal with. I have a hard time with it every time. It doesn't feel comfortable. Agreement. The sun is negative in Cancer. The moon is positive in an airy sign in Aquarius, fourth house. The ascendant is positive in an airy sign with Libra at the ascendant. Now this is a very peculiar disagreement. With the positive ascendant in moon as the conveyor, you would think that those two things would combine to draw him out, that their positivity would draw him out and make him very fluent. But then you look at Neptune on the ascendant, and that is a sensitivity that has a kind of shyness that's difficult to overcome. It may still mean that there is a positive outbreathing, that he does pour things out and things are drawn out of him, but what comes out of him is sensitive and maybe a little spooky. I'm thinking of like that song, Moon Shadow. It's a uh, really... Uh, Curious, spooky kind of song. It doesn't, you know, when you, you, you look at the words, the words really don't mean, don't say anything, you know, that are, it's just an uh, eerie kind of thing. Sun, ascendant and moon in airy signs. 
in positive signs. Um, so he's probably extremely selective in the choice of what he takes in. But he's still gullible. Like anything that he takes in of a spiritual nature, and he studied all different kinds of spiritual things, anything that he takes in affects him. And it's because everything gets amplified with the uh, Neptune on the Ascendant. When you look at the sun, it looks like it's isolated and it's out of place in the uh, tenth house. Cancer would much rather be in the fourth house behind the scenes. And here it is up on the top. It's famous. He maybe wanted fame, but when he found out what it was, then he didn't want it anymore. So both the outer person and the inner person are very sensitive and easily made uncomfortable or easily brought out of tune. And uh, moreover, there's not a good communication between them. Like he feels the truth in all these things he picks up from the outside world, but it isn't what he feels in his inner nature. And he has to say something, when he gets it out, it's, it's a specialized kind of thing, but it isn't exactly what he wanted. And so there's something of a, uh, something of a couple kinds of inversions in there. When you go to the uh, stage profile, he's just after the full moon, about day number 15 in the lunation cycle. And that indicates being off balance another way. Everything is changing from first phase, where the moon was getting bigger, to uh, second phase, where the moon is getting smaller. The first phase, or the, the waxing moon, is a building time, and the waning moon is a tearing apart time. So in shifting from one to the other, there is indecisiveness. And it's an indecisiveness about whether since the sun represents will and the moon represents imagination, which do I use, will or imagination? So anyone born at the full moon has a lot of vacillation. They swing back and forth about about almost anything. Then if you look at the uh, ascendant, Libra is a very vacillating ascendant. It goes back and forth and up and down. And with Neptune conjoined to it, it's even more sensitive in its librations. So if we take these two profiles and put them together, there is a great deal of instability. And there's a great deal of internal contradiction. And no matter what, no matter if he has a, res a religion that is absolute, that he's told everything that is true, he still going to be uncomfortable no matter what his circumstance is. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a chart that will rest easily. Not a chart that I like and nobody else likes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got a chart full of uh, a chart, a class full of men with uh, a woman that is considered a man hater. Simone de Beauvoir. I like the chart a lot. I like the person a lot. Of course, I haven't read all of those works yet. That will you knock me, I guess. Um, <laughs> looking at the agreement profile. The sun is negative in Capricorn. The moon is negative in Pisces, and the ascendant is negative in Scorpio. Now, this is a chart with all kinds of submergence in it. First of all, everything or most of the crucial significators are beneath the surface of the earth. One kind of submergence. And there's a lot of things in retreative houses 
another kind of submergence. So, the agreement profile says there is a lot of concordance. And this is to a purpose, but that purpose is not going to be obvious. With all of the earth, there's something very critical. With all of the water, there's a lot of questioning and curiosity. But those qualities don't take away from the agreement. You can have an agreement in yourself where your curiosity and your critical analysis of things are in perfect harmony with each other, and that's the way it is with her. With so much submerged, it will probably take a really strong act of will for her to extrovert everything that she has inside of herself, and it may not be completely clear what she is when it does come out. But that doesn't mean that her character isn't consistent, and that doesn't mean that uh, she doesn't have a basic internal harmony. She's born one day past the first sextile and one day before the first square, approximately around day six of the lunation cycle. It's hard to say whether she's coasting from the beginner's luck of the first sextile or whether she's slowing down as she approaches that materializing first square where everything is uh, made as physical as can be. It's probably a little bit of each. To me, this seems very uh, purposeful. It seems like with the stage, she has drawn from a wide variety of facts and has picked up a kind of intellectual or spiritual momentum, and she's now ready to objectify it, and she's ready to square off with an impedimental force. And that, I would say, describes her uh, philosophical life. She takes it probably as a personal battle, and with the second house, she may even consider it her duty to fight the good fighter, do the struggling that she does. She's probably, because of the earthy sign and because of the second house in the stage uh, profile, she's probably much more practical than any of the other existentialists who got off on all kinds of intellectual trips and wrote some beautiful literature but weren't very practical. Uh, her existential accepting of the facts of reality as they are um, was more successful, I think, than most. All right. Herman Hess. Well, well I've got the clock up there. I'm still looking at the... <laughs> oh, we're just about... To, we're, we'll do this in just a little bit over an hour. By golly. Herman Hess, first looking at the agreement profile. The sun is negative in Cancer. The moon is negative in Pisces. And the ascendant is positive in Sagittarius. And the ruler of the ascendant happens to be in the first house. So it's a water, water, fire kind of agreement. And that's clearly a disagreement. Fire and water don't get <laughs> don't get along very well. Yes. No. No. Um, the outer person is very bright, very light, very optimistic. The middle and inner person are much more likely to be moody, self-protective, 
kind of having kind of uh, I don't know how you say it, creepy feeling things. <laughs> now you might get the idea of meeting this person that this was somebody shallow. From the outer appearances, it might almost seem like a little Pollyanna uh, attitude. But you'd have to get an intimate understanding, as you always do with cancer. They don't open up easily. The shell doesn't open up unless there's intimacy or food, one or the other. <laughs> and usually the food leads to intimacy. If you want to get close, you share a food that they like. Uh, maybe this is a benign disagreement. When we looked at the Ethel Barrymore chart, we saw that that disagreement had some very benign characteristics about it. That's what's beautiful about astrology. Any combination, you can put it together in one way or another that you can use it to positive effect. And you may not be completely comfortable while you're doing it, but you can bring, you can bring something really very positive out of all things. Cancer likes to keep things at home. It likes an integral kind of womb. It would have everything together inside in the womb all the time. Pisces likes chaos. And it likes a compound chaos where things are uh, more chaotic than uh, the one thing is more chaotic than the next and they add to each other. Pisces consciousness has everything there often, but it needs a touchstone to point something out. You say, oh, I knew that all the while, because it's in that uh, in that haze or in that cloud of Piscean consciousness. So those two signs like to keep things inward and keep things whole. But the optimism and the generosity and perhaps maybe even the overcommitment of Jupiter and Sagittarius might be just the thing to uh, extend all of these things, to draw them out, unravel all of those things that are twisted together or intertwined and the ponderings and the mullings and things like that that go on. So the Sagittarian part of him, you know, might, he might commit to writing something and uh, even though he may be uncomfortable all the way in the extroversive process, he, uh, he'll still get it done. The stage, this is the third writer that we have. This wasn't planned this way, but it was really an interesting study going through this. I, I go through it in the regular handouts. Uh, this is the third writer in this second half batch, batch of the charts that has that the sun and moon are somewhere around the second trine. This is one day past the second trine. It's about day 21 or day 22, somewhere in there. The thing that is in, that is in common with all three writers with this second trine is that all of their writings are based on cultural history or natural history or political history or whatever. But each one does it in a different way. Hess was much more subtle than Mishima. Uh, Mishima's writing a lot of it. He tried to shock people and he intentionally did so. And he wrote some very lurid things. And, and Japanese society accepted it. I, I find it hard to believe that they would accept what, it, what, what he put out there. It was written beautifully, you know, but uh, and, uh, we're talking about the masses. Like he was publishing things about sadomasochism and things like that in women's magazines, and he was getting paid well for it as long as he wasn't too deep, which is perfectly fine for him because he was probably writing about three or four books at the same time. And he had enormous, enormous output in poetry, in plays, and in novels. And uh, his, his was pretty dramatic, what he put out. What uh, happens uh, with Hess, uh, he isn't violent, and he isn't overt like uh, Mishima, 
having the sun in, in Cancer in the seventh house is much, much more indirect. Yeats wrote about politics, and he wrote political poems to political heroes, but uh, Hess didn't do that. He looks at the signs of the times, and he took uh, Jung's philosophy as the basis for one of his novels, but you wouldn't guess it by reading the novel. It's the novel of um, Narcissus and Goldman. Uh, he's based on Jung's psychology of types, the early, develop the early uh, uh, psychology of types by Jung, which he modified quite a bit later on. But... Um, Hess always reflected on these things and gentilified them and uh, rather than chastise the other intellectuals for giving in to the, uh, uh, for giving in to the uh, Nazis and rather than committing Harakari to shame them the way Mishima would do, what uh, Hess did he writes this strange story of Magister Ludi, and uh, it shows the absurdity and the purposelessness of how intellectuals keep themselves removed from society. So what he does, he does very indirectly. And he does it in a, in a sort of a coy way that, uh, so that, uh, that he, you don't even know what he's getting across to you. So he took this, uh, he was a second stage unwinder where he brought out the conditions of society or of politics or of history. He would bring them out, but he would bring them out in a way that was uh, uh, so distended that it almost was unrecognizable what he was doing. So this, to me, looks like a benign, uh, benign discomfort in the general... Uh, Focus profiles. All right, we have one more. Yes. I mean, I would have thought with Benson and Jupiter in the third policy, with this rulership. It can take that that route, but it doesn't. We have to be gentle with Liz because she's now undergoing cancer therapy. She has skin cancer, and rather than cutting it out because her face is supposed to be so beautiful, they're doing all kinds of weird things so that she doesn't have scar tissue on her face. Uh, <laughs> Ah, all right. Agreement. The sun is negative in watery Pisces. The moon is negative in watery Scorpio. And the ascendant is positive in airy Libra. So everything you don't see is very different from what you do see. And she, this is somebody that probably more than anybody else in that industry, which is an industry of illusion, has probably lived with the awareness of the contradiction of the illusion of the outer image versus the inner individual. Uh, men tend to objectify outward parts of, or bodies of women anyway. To me, this disagreement seems more difficult in the disagreement that Hess had. Libra is less extrovertive than Sagittarius, and Scorpio is more intractable than uh, either Cancer or Pisces. So you have a kind of delicate positive rising sign trying to deal with a soul nature that can be kind of ornery from time to time and an inner spiritual nature that is quite elusive. Moreover, the Libra on the Ascendant is a compromiser. 
and is the pleaser. It's always trying to please whoever is before it, especially if that happens to be a mate. The middle being is uh, hidden beneath that, and even beneath that, the uh, spiritual being is hidden, so that you all have this pleasant surface, but what's underneath, you never really know what it is. So it's something like the image that I get is something like when, like an aquifer, an aquifer deep underground, and there's something above it that looks quite pleasant, but you don't get to recognize all the fertility that is deep underneath. Despite being an actress and being compelled to fame, with this kind of thing, she may never express all of her feelings. And as a consequence, those feelings probably get stronger and more intense. And I'm not sure that she can really sublimate them all. And what might happen is that she might develop some kind of a view of life that is a tragic acceptance of the fact that people can't get everything out from inside of them that they would like. And uh, I think she senses that in other people. Uh, this is why I think she is close to Michael Jackson, because uh, she senses that underneath all of that uh, very modified exterior is something that's trying to get out in the same way that she's trying to get out and being very unsuccessful with it. With another chart, when we look at the stage test, it's a day and a half past the second trine. It's about day 22 of the lunation cycle. However, I don't think she's a seeker of cultural meaning. At least not to my knowledge, she isn't. The way this seems to work, as I understand her character, is she is aware, keenly aware, of people's suffering beneath the surface. And in the broadening effect of the second trine, of the universalizing trine, she has a very, very broad compassion. And that compassion is universalized by that stage of the cycle. I think that this is why she tries to give back to the world. A lot was given to her. She was wealthy from, from childhood on, from her acting career. And um, she tries to give back, and she tries to give back in a very big way, in a very wide way, and the giving back is always universal. It isn't a personal charity. It is, she goes for some already established large-scale charity. This does not have the abstract or theoretical quality about it that the... Uh, second trine did for all of the writers. At least I don't know about it in her life. So she's an indirect do-gooder that is never completely satisfied and always feels like she and everyone else is heading for trouble. And I think that that's what the general focus profiles indicate. All right. Yes. The fact that her son was in the first house was that giving out on stage uh, yes, but I wouldn't say that it's a really strong, just a, that house positioning alone is, is, is really strong, but we'll get to some of those things when we go into the detailed things. Okay. Yes. Yes. They greatly intensify and they indicate special cases. All right, now this is the second half. This is the uh, written version, and the written version is all not, there has to be some overlap because it's the same reality, but in the, in the written version, uh, we look at it in a slightly different way. And this is the assignment for next time. Next time the real fun begins because now we start cross-profiling all the profiles 
And so we're going to work on the cross profiling for the first eight charts next time. And uh, whoever wants to read out their examples can read out their examples to the class. And or they would even just just verbalize them, it'll be just fine. And so this is the assignment. And then the, so we have two two classes in a row now where we work on cross profiling. John has been in an earlier version of cross profiling that was not quite so wild and woolly, but he knows what's uh, what it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just been one up. <laughs> I'm going to turn lights down because I don't want to get any hotter. Yes. Yes, that is one of the definitions of the equinox. The only reason I asked the question was because it's uh, I'm looking at this, uh, just having a look at the asteroid thing, and uh, it lets it go for. Um, I don't know what they're doing there. You could ask, you could write in and ask them a question. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much.